So I'd like to welcome everybody. And our program today is brought to you by our Patient Insight webinar sponsors, Bristol Myers Squibb, EMD Serono Pfizer Partnership, Fair Gene, Genentech, Merck, and Eurogen. My name is Stephanie Chisholm, and I'm the Director of Education and Research at the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. We know that the risk for bladder cancer exists um, in veteran populations. And even after you are out of a dangerous situation while you're serving, the risk of life-threatening diseases still continues. And complications don't end when you leave military service. And in spite of the fact that the Institute of Medicine report looked at a possible connection between Agent Orange and bladder cancer based on the herbicides that were used in Vietnam 40 years ago, we know that veterans today are still having issues fighting for their health care, just as they fought on the battlefield. The battle continues, and we do have some more recent veterans that are coming in based on exposures that they may have had in the war on terror and, you know, toxic burn pits and things that have been happening around veteran installations. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Stephen Williams from the University of Texas Medical Branch, Dr. Jen Taylor from Baylor College of Medicine, and Dr. Josh Meeks from Northwestern University. And it's a great pleasure to have you here. They all have some real vested interest in the veteran population. Dr. Williams is the Chief of the Division of Urology, as well as the Director of Urologic Oncology and Urologic Research Departments at his institution. He's heavily involved with many societies associated with bladder cancer across the world. His main focus in research is comparing the cost and effectiveness of bladder cancer treatments. He's going to talk about some of the work that he's been doing in understanding the impact on the veteran community. Dr. Taylor is an assistant professor of urology at Baylor College of Medicine, and she also concurrently practices at the Emmy DeBakey VM, uh, VAMC in Houston, Texas. So she's working within the Veterans Administration. She serves as an associate residency program director and director of preclinical and clinical urology courses for medical students. Dr. Taylor's involved in clinical research in multiple genital urinary malignancies with a focus on bladder cancer and a research in medical education, and she's involved in the national medical communities. Dr. Meeks is an assistant professor of urology at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago, as well as the section chief of robotic surgery at Jesse Brown VA Medical Center. He is a urologic surgeon with expertise in the diagnosis and management of bladder cancer. So I am going to turn my screen over to you. Dr. Williams, let me just give you the mouse. Okay, Dr. Williams, take it away. You should be able to control the mouse now. All right, thank you very much, Stephanie. And I'd like to thank uh, specifically the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network, as well as importantly, and as you pointed out, you know, all of the veterans um, that we are giving this particular uh, webinar to. And thank you for all of your service and particularly this special day. Um, hopefully you find today's webinar uh, suitable uh, but more importantly, provide some interesting uh, information and where we stand and what we know at this particular point. Uh, as, uh, as previously mentioned, I'm the professor in chief of the Division of Urology at the University of Texas Medical Branch. In addition, medical director for high value care um, at my institution. So bladder cancer statistics, where do we stand in 2020? Well, with bladder cancer specifically, it affects both men and women and is the sixth most common cancer when we compare against all cancers in the United States. However, as I previously alluded to, bladder cancer affects both males and females. However, bladder cancer is approximately four times more common among males than females. Uh, in addition, among males, it's the fourth most common cancer. However, uh, when we look at... Oops. I'm sorry about that. I touched my mouse by accident. You touched the mouse. Don't do that. <laughs> I'm not touching the mouse. I am, I'm not going to touch the mouse. 
<laughs> no, that's okay. So um, as I was getting to, uh, also too among males, uh, it's the eighth most common cause of death. However, what we need to be mindful of is uh, cancer incidence, particularly among those veterans. And what we know from looking at large data, uh, particularly in the VA health system. And when we try to compare, you know, versus those that are, as I previously mentioned to uh, the general population in the United States versus those in the VA population, bladder cancer is the fourth most common cancer overall. However, what we have found is that bladder cancer is more commonly diagnosed earlier among our veteran population, however, also is the fourth most common cancer among males. And I think one of the key questions that a number of veterans, as well as investigators, we want to understand why. And is this a nature versus nurture or environment versus genetics? And when we also come down to the research, particularly, we're focused on exposures versus actually underst understanding the genomics. And my colleague, uh, Dr. Meeks, will talk more specifically in regard to uh, subtypes, mutations, and other interesting research uh, that is really exciting work uh, currently underway. When we're talking about uh, risk factors, which I will get to eventually, uh, one of the uh, most uh, uh, intriguing uh, is looking at association versus causation. And a large body of the research that is particularly being done in the VA at a population-based level uh, is looking at associations. Uh, and an association does not automatically imply causation, uh, but also too importantly as an example for this is exposures. And exposure to arsenic is associated with a higher risk of bladder cancer. However, what's important is whether or not is it causative of bladder cancer. And important work is being done uh, using animal models such as uh, Dr. Meeks's excellent research that he has done when looking at particular risk factors and bladder cancer. And in specifically, as we all know, smoking is associated with bladder cancer um, and particularly with uh, occupation and environmental exposures as well when considering smoking has about 50% of the cases and then the uh, occupational exposure is about 20% of cases. And these are some common environmental or important uh, occupational exposures to consider that have been associated with bladder cancer. And in addition, we, we also mention an infectious organism that is also associated uh, with bladder cancer. And specifically smoking in itself, um, as we previously alluded to, when we're looking in the VA population itself, uh, in this data that is performed nearly about 20 years ago, 27% uh, versus 21% of veterans versus non-veterans actually smoked. And in the data set that I'm going to present to you all today, we found roughly almost 80% of veterans are actually ever smokers. And when we assess over a 20 year period. So a lot of the data that we are collecting today is, is very useful but also owns to the fact of what time period you're assessing uh, this information. And then in addition, we're also concerned as uh, with bladder cancer more commonly diagnosed in a younger population of veterans, uh, smoking rates are highest among young veterans. And as I mentioned before, uh, risk factors and exposures, age in orange uh, is obviously one of the topics of today's webinar. And to date, as uh, Stephanie alluded to, only limited data exists regarding a, a link or an association between Agent Orange and bladder cancer risk, and importantly, death. And prior to 2014, Agent Orange was not even considered a bladder cancer risk factor. However, in 2014, uh, this was upgraded uh, from Agent Orange from no association to limited evidence. And the Institute of Medicine concluded that there's actually an interplay between Agent Orange exposure and bladder cancer outcomes uh, is an area of needed research. And based upon this, the VA is considering bladder cancer as an Agent Orange related disease. However, while some data suggest, suggest Agent Orange exposure increases bladder cancer risk, not all data disagree. 
not all data agree. And to provide a true measure of aggressiveness of bladder cancer, um, my group particularly found it crucial to study not only bladder cancer diagnosis, but also the long terms, uh, long term outcomes such as bladder cancer death. And in 2016, the DOD uh, had the first time the focus area of bladder cancer. And I was uh, very lucky to team, with a team up with a group, um, Cedar sinai UTMB, and in addition within the VA and the Institute of Medical Research over in Durham to leverage a team that actually also determined an association of Agent Orange and, and prostate cancer. Um, and what we were able to do is actually uh, put together a team uh, to very much uh, determine the, the risk of Agent Orange and bladder cancer, but also death related to bladder cancer. However, in doing so, uh, what we leveraged and what we're awarded to do and what we have developed is the largest true nationwide cohort ever assembled to study bladder cancer according to Agent Orange exposure, which consists data of over 11.7 million veterans from the largest integrated healthcare system in the country, the VA health system. And this is a brief illustration of the, uh, uh, the grant uh, primary objective and secondary objectives, uh, looking at the link between Agent Orange exposure and bladder cancer risk, but also to Agent Orange exposure and whether or not is linked with bladder cancer death. And this is a brief illustration of the team. Uh, this is a career development award. And what we're able to develop is the bladder longitudinal assessment database to direct epidemiology research. And this was co-led by Dr. Stephen Friedland, as well as the team at uh, the Durham VA Medical Center Institute of Medical Research. Uh, we were able to um, identify, as I previously mentioned, uh, roughly 11.7 million patients, uh, 181,200 cases of bladder cancer with tissue linked. In addition, we're able to identify almost a million uh, patients that were exposed to Asian Orange. And then out of those, almost uh, a little over 16,000 had bladder cancer and Asian Orange. And with this data, um, we were able to also determine not only uh, that uh, specific cohort of patients, but also um, analyze and assess and determine uh, male versus female, and in addition, which is also important bladder cancer research, um, you know, what, uh, racial, race and ethnicity. And to put this in perspective, uh, you know, this population has a little over uh, than uh, 10,000 African Americans uh, is uh, quite impressive from a bladder cancer database and to generalize our findings. And today, um, unfortunately, I, I cannot elicit any of the analyses in whether or not uh, bladder cancer is associated or Agent Orange is associated with bladder cancer. Uh, preliminary analyses are complete and results and publications are expected in 2021. However, importantly, further veteran-centered uh, studies are forthcoming, including health services research, mental health disparities, and genomics. And this is a very exciting time for bladder cancer research overall. And I have to uh, thank my team, uh, particularly at the Durham VA, Duke and Institute of Medical Research, including Stephen Friedland, Amanda DeHoyt, uh, Lauren Howard, uh, Megan Foster, Ruxin Yang, uh, who developed also to our natural language programming, uh, which is critical to this large scale uh, study. And in addition, my team at uh, University of Texas Medical Branch, my department chairman, Dr. Uh, Doug Tyler, uh, our uh, director of St uh, biostatistics, Yong Feng Kuo, director of epidemiology, uh, Jacques Blargeon, and most importantly, the veterans um, who uh, provide the salient data to hopefully uh, to determine once and for all is Agent Orange linked uh, with bladder cancer. Thank you very much.